Hi, Wall Church. Today we're going to continue our sermon series looking through the book of James. Today we'll be looking at chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Today's sermon title is, Where Does My Anger Come From? Today, in the book of James, in the verses that we read, we see that James is addressing anger. And the reason why he is addressing anger is, we are all angry people. Anger is a response from fear. So fear leads to anger. So really, we are people living in fear. Fear of losing control. Fear of not having enough. Fear of being alone. Fear of no one liking us. Fear of God not loving us. And because we live in fear, we manifest our fear in anger. And sometimes we think by being angry, we take control of situations. Ironically, you don't even have control over your anger when you're upset. The main concern of James is faith. Now, when it comes to faith, there are two different ways to look at faith. One is profession, and one is practice. Oftentimes, we are great at professing our faith. But what good is it if we profess faith, yet we don't practice it? What good is it if we know theology and we could teach theology, but we don't practice our own faith? To live by faith means that not only do we say that we believe, but we live and we pr practice our faith. It's almost like the movie Spider-Man where they say, with great power comes great responsibility. With faith comes action. So if we don't live out our faith, are we saved? Are we saved just because we said a prayer? No, brothers and sisters. We will know our faith by our fruit. So what do we do about our anger? Well, James is not only talking about anger, but also speech. Because when we're angry and when we're upset, we say things that we tend to regret later on. Or when we're upset, we do things that later on we would regret. But since we have a lot of Asians at our church, we have a different way of expressing our anger. And it is through passive aggressiveness. The NYU Medical Center defines passive aggressiveness as this. Individuals who may appear to comply or act appropriately, but actually behaves negatively and passively resists. So you, ha you may know people who are passive aggressive, or you yourself may be passive aggressive. And what's behind this passive aggressiveness? It usually is from anger or resentment or frustration. So we need to deal with our anger and ultimately we need to deal with our fear. As I said earlier, fear leads to anger and anger leads to regrettable actions, whether it's the words that we say or are hurtful or harmful actions. And if we are always living in anger, or if our mechanism to deal with stress or unpleasant situation is anger, then truly are we people of faith? Well, let's look at today's word and find out. Know this. What he's saying is pay attention. So it's a transitional verse, 
And he's basically wanting the readers to really pay attention about what he is about to say. And once again, like last week, he says, my beloved brothers, or my beloved brothers and sisters. So once again, everything that, the, that James is talking about here is based on love. He loves the church. So he doesn't want to hurt the church with his instructions, but he wants to build up the church with his instructions. And only a loving teacher and a loving pastor and a loving leader can do that. It's because he loves the church that he needs to point out the issue at hand. And so relationship here is based on love. And for those of you who like to be critical, and a lot of us are critical thinkers or a lot of us have opinions about things, when we're critical about a situation in a relationship, let's make sure that whatever we say comes out of love. That we don't say things to hurt or to knock people down, but that there is a positive intent behind our teaching, a positive intent in our words, in our correction. Well, let's make sure whether we are talking to a friend or a family member or our children. It could be our spouse. Let's make sure that we speak in love. And the rest of verse 19 teaches us how to speak in love even when you are correcting. It says here, let every person be quick to hear. Now, we're often told that we have two ears. God created us with two ears and one mouth. Why? Because we need to listen more than we speak. And let's be honest, that's even with our relationship with God. What is your relationship with God like? Do you speak to him or are you hearing from him? What is God saying to you these days? We need to hear from God on a daily basis. And just as we need to hear from God on a daily basis, our relationship with others must be based on active listening. So when someone is speaking to you, we need to pay attention to that person. So if you have your phone out and you're just nodding your head as the other person's speaking, but you're on your phone, or you're watching t TV, or you're just... Your, your mind is wandering all over the place, then you are not listening. That's not how relationships work. And I imagine that some of us are spending time with God in the same fashion. We may have the Bible open, but we have the TV running in the background, or we got music playing, or we're reading the Bible on our computers, but we also have other windows open, our chats open, our emails open, and we are constantly being interrupted. And when you're being interrupted, then you are not actively listening. So put away your phone. And I'm speaking to myself as well. I need to put away my phone. And if you have a watch that talks to you, put away your watch. And just spend quality time with God. Spend quality time with your spouse or family members or friends. And I guarantee you, your re relationship is going to be different in that scenario. So we need to be quick to hear. Now, the Proverbs actually speaks a lot about this. In traditional Jewish wisdom, in our Old Testament wisdom, quick to hear, slow to speak is taught throughout the Proverbs. Proverbs 11, 12 says this, Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent, slow to speak. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. Proverbs 7, 28 says that. Proverbs 17, 28 says that. Here's what it says in Proverbs 17, 27. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit is a man of 
understanding. And James wrote this because he recognizes that his readers are struggling in this area with speech and anger. And it's all too often that uncontrolled anger leads us to speak quickly and say too much. I don't know if you've ever been in a relationship where there's someone who always speaks too much. Or they say hurtful things. They make a judgment without gathering all the facts, without listening. They've already made a decision of what their next steps are going to be. Or maybe you're like that when you're having a discussion with somebody. You've already figured out what the problem is. And you're just waiting for your turn to speak. That is not being quick to hear and slow to speak. In your mind, you've already said what you had to say. You've already checked out of that conversation. You've already checked out of that relationship. And that kind of relationship does not work in a community. That kind of relationship does not work in the church. So what James is talking about here, he is not forbidding anger altogether. He says, slow to anger. But let's face it, I don't know if any one of us are capable of having righteous anger. I believe only our Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated righteous anger. So let's leave the anger to God and let's just be free from that, amen? Let's be quick to hear, slow to speak, and maybe no to anger instead of slow to anger. And what happens when you're angry? Earlier I said it leads to regrettable actions, but also it leads to reg regrettable speech. Proverbs 18.21 says this, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So with your own mouth, with your tongue, you could bring life to somebody, you could encourage somebody, you can give hope to somebody, but you could also bring death somebody sometimes your words are more hurtful than actually physically harming somebody that's the power of our tongue so we need to be very ca careful we need to be quick to hear but slow to speak and this biblical idea this Biblical wisdom has also been taught in the secular realm. A lot of people take credit for what was already written in the Bible. And actually, if you read a lot of the self-help books, they're really paraphrasing Proverbs. They're really paraphrasing wisdom captured in the Bible. So brothers and sisters, we don't really need to read these self-help books all too much? Let's read the Bible. Let's open up our ears and our hearts to God and His wisdom. Because a lot of the self-help wisdom, quote-unquote wisdom, is really from the Bible. Here's an example. Simon Sinek said this, you know, be the last to speak. And he says, the skill to hold your opinions to yourself until everyone has spoken does two things. One, it gives everybody else the feeling that they've been heard. It gives everyone else the ability to feel they have contributed. And two, you get the benefit of hearing what everybody else has to think before you render your opinion. He is paraphrasing Proverbs. He is paraphrasing what James is teaching here. And so let's supplement the Bible with what he's saying. Let's listen first. Let's be, let's, slow to, let's be slow to speak and let's slow to anger. And here's the real issue with anger. For anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. James is concerned about not only professing faith, but that the church is practicing faith. 
how, what good is it if the church teaches sound theology, but none of the members practice faith? We need to be able to practice our faith. Our character needs to represent God's character. So, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God, it, what it really means is, for the practice of human anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. So the righteousness of God is the righteous life that he wants us to live. So when you're always angry, or if your response to stress is anger, or your response to fear is anger, or your response to not being in control is anger, I'm not just talking about bursting out in anger. I'm also talking about being passive aggressive. These all speak to your character and how you are not practicing your faith. And church is where we see passive aggressiveness the most, isn't it? So what does that really mean? So is church a collection of believers or is church a collection of people who are not living out their faith. Now, we're not going to be able to live out our faith 100%, but we need to be practicing our faith, and we need to be be sanctified each day by the Holy Spirit, and we need to encourage and edify one another. So we need to live by God's righteous standard. That's what God expects of us if we belong to him when we belong to him. When we profess our faith, God's expectation is that we practice our faith. So practicing faith and profession go hand in hand. You may have heard that all you need to do is say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and you are saved. That's profession. But if you do say that, then you have to mean it. And then the practice follows. You don't practice so that you're saved. But you practice because you are saved. Verse 21, and our final verse that we're going to be looking at today says this, Therefore, according to this principle, therefore, put away all filthiness and rampart wickedness it's saying, the, 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 the word put away here, the idea is taking off your clothing. So take off your clothing. It reminds us, and it should remind us, of our baptism. Now, modern baptisms are different than first century baptism because first century baptism, they had to go through three years of catechisms before you were actually baptized on Easter Sunday. And when you did it, you took off your clothes as a symbol of putting away your filthiness, putting away your rampart, rampart wickedness. It was a symbol of that. And so when you did that, it is signifying rebirth. It is signifying that you are a new creation. And so that's what it means to be a believer. When you profess faith, that means you have put away your filthiness and you are cleansed. And that's really the, the, what's behind baptism. And so when James says, put away all filthiness, he's saying, think back to the time when you received Jesus Christ, when you became a new creation, when the old has gone and the new has come. Put away all filthiness. And he says here, and receive with meekness. Another way to say that is in humility, with humility. Receive the implanted word. The word of truth is what James called earlier. The implanted word. I really like that adjective, implanted word. There's the idea of Growth. There's the idea of the word germinating inside you. 
And how do you do that? If the word is planted in your heart, it, it grows in you. So we need to water it. It needs soil. And that word is going to continue to grow. And that word of truth, the Bible, the word of God, has already been implanted in you, but is it growing? And the, the way we, we grow this word, the way the word of God takes root in you and takes root in God's people is through what? Through humility. So we must, with humility, receive the word. When you read God's instruction, a lot of times we don't agree with this. Earlier on, I was talking to somebody and uh, they were talking about how, how some people are struggling with um, how to submit to one another. Submission is a very difficult teaching of the Bible, especially when it says wives submit to your husbands. A lot of wives struggle with that passage. But the whole idea of submissiveness comes from us submitting to Christ. But the only way we're able to receive teachings like th these is by receiving the word in humility. We need to receive God's instruction with humility, with meekness. We need to receive the word, and the word needs to take root in our lives. And when we do that, when we live our lives that way, then and only then do we practice faith. And that's really what the church is supposed to be. Church is supposed to be a gathering of people who with meekness receive the implanted word. And God's word just takes root in our lives and it grows. And we manifest faith and we encourage one another through faith and we live by faith and not by sight. We can only do this through the word of God, which was given to us here, freely given to us. Jesus Christ paid for this by dying on the cross. He was silenced so we could hear his word. God did not speak to him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me was the cry of Jesus Christ. He was forsaken so that we would not be. So because of Jesus Christ, we are able to hear the word of God with our two ears. And we are able to take root. The Holy Spirit will help us take root in this implanted word in our lives. And we're able to live for him because he gave his life for you and me and all of us who profess our faith. And because by his saving death, we have life, we are also able to practice our faith no matter what our circumstance may be. That's what it means to be a people who live by faith and not by sight. We're going to hear more about this next week in our sermon series. I'm going to be taking a break from the series in James and Pastor Mike and I are actually going to be preaching together in a four-part series. And we're going to be talking about what it means to be living by faith and not by sight. So stay tuned for that next week. But today and this week, let us listen to the Word of God and let's make sure that the implanted Word takes root in our lives. So let's spend time with Him in prayer. Let's spend time meditating His Word as the scripture says, we ought to meditate on his word day and night, like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. That's what Psalm 1 says. And that is what I am picturing as I'm reading these words from James. So let's receive with meekness the implanted word. And it's this implanted word, it's this word that is able to save your souls. How powerful is the Word of God. And we take the Bible for granted 
Let us no longer take the word of God for granted. The power to save is all recorded here for you and me. May his word bless you this week. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the sanctifying work, Holy Spirit, in our lives. We thank you for teaching us about what sanctification is. That's the implanted word taking root in our lives. So Lord, I pray that we will be a people who not only professes our faith boldly, but that we practice our faith boldly, boldly as well. And we can only do this through the power of you, Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, lead us, guide us, convict us, and transform us, we pray.